Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, I'm just going to wait for 30 seconds or so just because I can see the number of attendees is going up uh, and then we'll commence the presentation. Okay, so it looks like we have uh, um, quite a number of attendees on the line. So hello and welcome to the first of State um, Archives and Records, Record Keeping Standards and Advices webinar series. Um, my name is Tara Major and in today's webinar, I'll be discussing how to determine requirements to initiate digitization programs, including the rules for destruction of original records following digitization. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country on which we meet, which for myself at the Western Sydney Record Centre today is the Darug people. Let us be reminded of the long-standing connection between First Nations people and the pieces of earth on which we stand. Let us pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging. So a little housekeeping um, before we get into the presentation. Uh, the audience will be kept on mute during the presentation. We will be posting a copy of the presentation online. Um, today we have Irene and Angela monitoring the chat. Uh, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box as we go and we will discuss during the Q&A at the end of the presentation. To make the webinar a little more interactive, I'll periodically stop to ask some questions or rather do a little poll of the audience um, just to get a sense of your digitization aims and experiences. We also have an exit survey. It's only three questions long and your feedback is very much valued and it will help us tailor our online program offerings. Okay, so let's begin. Digitization programs can take a number of shapes and may broadly aim to integrate hard copy records into business systems and processes so that future actions can occur digitally, preserve and enhance accessibility of retrospective record sets, and capture paper generated from non-digital business processes. For example, mail, hard copy forms or receipts, and putting those into record keeping or business systems. In the context of this webinar, a digitization program can refer to any one of these scenarios and it may even include some crossover. I do acknowledge that different types of programs may need to be tailored in different ways. I will call out a few considerations as we go, but intend to keep this high level and applicable to all. Now I have a little poll to get us started. Um, and that one is, does your organization have an active digitization program? You just launch that. Oh, there we go. Poll has opened. Okay, that's that's really interesting. There, I can see that about sort of a we've got a bit of an equal split with sort of a, a third of you um, having established programs, a third of you developing programs, and a third of you doing a little bit ad hoc um, digitization and perhaps you know wanting to, to start up a program. The typical digitization process uh, looks a little bit like this. Uh, firstly, there is an initiation phase. Sorry, my slide's not working there, but there is an initiation phase where public officers should um, determine outcomes, scope records, and set program requirements. From there, they can establish policies, procedures, business rules, plans, or contracts accordingly to govern digitization programs. Secondly, there is a digitization phase. 
involving records preparation, imaging, metadata capture, and quality assurance. And thirdly, a post-digitisation phase, where public offices will need to manage both the physical and digital records following digitisation. It's also important to monitor and review the program throughout um, for program effectiveness. So this webinar is really going to focus on that initiation step, which will set up your requirements for the rest of the process to flow on. Before initiating a program, public officers need to firstly define the high level outcomes that the program aims to achieve. Secondly, scope record selection to support the program aims. It is strongly recommended to first ensure that the functions and activities are covered by a current retention and disposal authority. Known retention periods can help inform your public officer's return on investment, business case, technical specifications, and requirements for digitization. Thirdly, consider requirements for the retention and disposal of source records post-digitization, as this may influence some of your requirements. You will need to determine requirements such as preparation of hard copy records for digitization, technical specifications, and file naming conventions, to name a few. Then document how the requirements will be implemented. For example, through business rules, policies, procedures, workflows, or even contracts if you're outsourcing. Essentially, before commencing a program, you should develop a governance strategy based on your requirements and objectives. Defining the program's purpose and intended outcome upfront helps inform your business case plans and decisions, such as those surrounding scope, technical specifications, metadata, etc. Outcomes may include increased access, information sharing and reuse, improved service delivery, preservation of information assets, or reduced physical storage, or saving on space or storage costs. So I've got a little poll here as well, um, which is about your digitization objectives. And on this one, you can select more than one answer. While you're answering, I'll just add that digitising records has, through this COVID-19 pandemic, become more desirable as both staff and customers wish to access information remotely. And I can see that in the results there, that um, the one that's coming up the highest is to increase um, access, information sharing and reuse. Um, but I can see also that you know all of those outcomes, they're all very popular with the audience here. Now I'm going to follow that one up with a bit of a second poll, um, which is a bit of a pop quiz and I promise I'm not marking you on it. Um, so this one is, can you destroy state records following digitisation? We get a lot of inquiries to this point. Okay, so um, I, I won't keep you in suspense. The answer there is uh, B, um, which is yes, provided certain conditions have been met. Um, I did try to, to trick you there. So for those of you that responded um, with the last answer there, um, I will call, um, cover off provisions for State Archives shortly. And um, a spoiler alert, it may have something to do with the creation date. So if you intend to destroy records after digitization, you must ensure the records and your digitization program meets the conditions of the general retention and disposal authority for original and source records that have been copied, or GA45, as I will refer to it here on. It's good practice to consider the requirements of GA45 upfront. 
when establishing policies, procedures or business rules for your digitisation programs. Um, whether this be scanning of incoming records, ongoing programs or wet retrospective um, projects, incorporating rules up front helps avoid issues later and enables you um, to destroy the um, source records with the confidence that the agency has a reliable and fit for purpose digital surrogate to meet future information needs. GA45 outlines the following conditions for destruction of original or source records. I'll include these into the discussion, into the discussion at the relevant points um, for determining the program requirements. I note that not all digitisation programs will aim to destroy the original or source records, but even so, it's good practice to ensure that those last um, few points there, points three to five, are covered off. Once we have, once we have defined um, your program's intended outcomes, which may or may not involve reducing physical holdings, uh, you'll need to consider which records will be in scope and how that scope is communicated or defined. If your digitisation program involves scanning of incoming records, scope could involve developing business rules to exclude inferior, facilitative or duplicated records that could be disposed of under normal administrative practice or NAP. For business process digitisation, scoping could involve identifying records relevant to a particular business process or that otherwise relate to the program's core outcomes. Whilst for back capture projects, record selection uh, may involve identifying high risk and high value records, uh, records which are frequently accessed or records with long term um, accountability or retention requirements. Retention and disposal authorities outline retention periods, which can help inform your public officer's selection of records and return of it on investment. As a general rule, avoid selecting time expired records that are eligible for destruction or that can be already disposed of under NAP. Uh, be cautious about selecting records with short retention periods or records that are rarely requested for access. Sentencing or evaluating the records retention requirements helps avoid unnecessary digitisation efforts. It also helps to confirm if the records can be destroyed following digitisation. If you intend to destroy records following digitisation, it should be noted that GA45 requires that the records do not fit any of the exclusion categories or that exclusions can be managed through the process, i.e. excluded records can be digitised but not destroyed. For the records to be cut, it also required for the records to be covered by an approved retention and disposal authority. The first condition of GA45 is that original records must not fall within one of the excluded records categories, as these records need to be retained in physical format. Exclusion one, original or source records that were created prior to January 1, 1980 and are required as state archives or required to be retained in agency. Note my emphasis on and. The 1980 creation date only applies to state archives and retaining agency records. If the records are not required as state archives, or not required to be retained in agency, they can be destroyed um, regardless of their creation date, provided that no other exclusions apply. A common approach to retrospective um, projects involving a mix of say the pre-1980 state archives and record otherwise eligible for destruction is to separate the physical records. Um, so either during the project preparation or during the QA stage. This means that you'll have those records that cannot be destroyed um, set aside for transfer. Um, Tara, excuse me. Um, yeah. Your presentation, I think, sort of froze a bit. Just to let you know. There we go. Okay. 
that up. Okay, so exclusion two, um, original is original or photographic film and audiovisual media that is required as state archives. The authority can only be applied to film or AV material if it is not required as state archives. If required as state archives, then contact us to discuss requirements for digitization and transfer. Exclusion three are state archives that are on loan or have been retrieved for you from the state archives collection, including from our regional repositories. These records need to be returned to us, not destroyed. Even if they have been in your custody for some time, we would appreciate them back. Exclusion four is uh, records with a legislative or government policy requirement that the original record not be destroyed. For example, under the Children and Young Persons Care and Protection Act, a child or young person is entitled to possession of the original documents upon leaving or having left out of home care. So the destruction of these original personal documents after copying would not comply with that legal provision. Exclusion five, records that are considered to have intrinsic value in their original format. For example, records that have a cultural, iconic, heritage or aesthetic value as a physical artifact. So if, if you're a little bit unsure about um, whether something has aesthetic or cultural value, uh, there is some further guidance for assessing that intrinsic value um, within the guidelines for use of GA45, which is available from our website. Exclusion six, records documenting special circumstance, personal information, or that of high personal value to the subject of the record. So for example, uh, handwritten letters and cards that may be found within Care Leavers case files are often of a high personal value, um, particularly where there is an absence of other childhood records. And finally, exclusion seven, source records that have been used as the input or source records for migration. So we actually have another disposal authority to cover that, which is the General Retention and Disposal Authority for source records that have been migrated, or GA48. So if the records happen to fit one or more of the exclusion categories, you cannot destroy them. However, you may still digitise them. Where the records are required as state archives, you can offload them by transferring them to us for safekeeping, if they are excluded for another reason, then you will need to retain them for the original retention period or until the limiting factor, legal action, for example, is completed. In many circumstances, the conditions relating to excluded records and disposal coverage are interlinked. If you are dealing with paper records over 40 years old, or photographic or audiovisual material of any age, your organisation will need to establish if the records are required as state archives in order to know if the exclusions apply. So this creates a bit of a dependency on retention and disposal authorities. Yet regardless of whether your records are likely to be required as state archives, your organisation must confirm that the records are covered by a disposal class within an approved retention and disposal authority either general or functional. G45 only gives you permission to destroy records that are covered. At present, most agencies do have comprehensive coverage, including the health districts and the local government sector, but it is your obligation to confirm. So please do that, particularly if your agency has recently picked up a new function or has been subject to administrative change. Comprehensive coverage is the best insurance for GA45, and we encourage public officers without comprehensive coverage to work with us to develop it. Something else to consider during the scoping stage is, is digitization the right outcome? Can alternative action deliver a more cost-effective result? 
So some factors to weigh up include if the records are required for active business use, um, could say data entry be a more cost effective solution and achieve similar outcomes? So for example, if the records are indexed, um, an on-demand digitization service uh, may be preferable to a full scale digitize everything approach. Um, if the records are required as state archives and not actively used, you could consider transferring them to us at State Archives and Records. Uh, we can also provide digital retrieval if required. Now, I'm not trying to deter you here. It's just that digitization can be costly and resource intensive. So public offices should weigh up business options carefully and also take into consideration the long-term management needs of the digitized images. You are um, creating a lot of data through digitization. Okay, so I have our next poll, which is, is your digitization undertaken in-house or are you outsourcing? So, Okay, so it looks like everyone there's either doing things sort of predominantly, mostly doing things predominantly, a, a bit of a mixture of in-house or outsourced or, or maybe in-house for um, some to meet some needs and outsourced to meet others. Um, it's quite interesting, so thank you. The third condition of GA45 is that authentic, complete and accessible copies of the records are made. Authentic copies are the product of established, authorised and monitored processes. Complete copies are accurate, legible reproductions of the original um, record in its entirety. Whilst accessible copies are managed and available and readable for the future. Requirements that relate to this concept include physical preparation, technical specifications and equipment used, metadata, quality control, and the management of digitized records. The goal for these requirements is to inform processes, either internal or external, so that the copies result in fit for purpose reproductions. Sorry, I just lost my place there. Okay, so preparing records for digitization can involve anything from basic unfolding and removal of staples to more in-depth stabilization, mold cleaning or professional conservation treatment and repairs. Preparation facilitates the scanning process and also helps ensure that authentic and complete copies of the records are made. For example, actions such as flattening a page or unfolding a dog ear to reveal the text underneath helps with completeness and the presentation of the digital page. Requirements for records preparation can vary program to program, depending on the condition of the original records, their format, digitization equipment available, and what will happen to the records following digitization. For example, you may choose to debind a volume to facilitate scanning if you already know that the volume will be destroyed post-digitization. If your program involves records that will be retained and are in poor condition, they could require additional preparation or even conservation treatment. It may be practical to triage records according to these preparation needs. Triage may also help with workflow and or budget allocation. Time and or cost to prepare records should be factored in to any project plans. Consideration also needs to be given to how original records are handled, particularly if fragile. Sometimes records may require use of specific equipment to protect them from damage. For example, 
use of a flatbed scanner as opposed to a document feeder. Setting appropriate technical specifications ensures quality, consistency, and that the digitised records are fit for purpose. It also helps ensure that the resulting digitised item can be considered authentic and complete. For example, the image resolution applied needs to be high enough to resolve text characters for the resulting image to be legible. Likewise, colour should be captured where it provides meaning to a record. The primary goal is to capture sufficient data so that the resulting image or file is of a sufficient quality for its purpose and can remain legible or usable for as long as required. Where records have long-term or archival value, the resulting digitised files may need to withstand the test of time and a number of migrations. If your technical specifications are insufficient, it may nullify any value you can derive from your digitisation program. State Archives and Records Digitisation Specifications for Paper Records in Public Offices aims to ensure that digitisation efforts result in the creation of authentic, reliable and usable digitised copies of paper records. Adopting the specification will enable your public office to meet the copying provisions set out in GA45. It is important to consider technical specifications before commencing digitisation or purchasing equipment. Technical specifications are just that, they are technical. Describing these in detail would make for a very lengthy webinar. So in a nutshell, resolution is a measure of the ability to capture samples from the original records. Bit depth governs a range of colours or shades of grey, or tonal range represented in the resulting image. A colour space helps software know how to render colour, although it's just one component of colour management, which also involves calibration and profiling. Compression is used to reduce the size of the resulting digital file for ease of storage and transmission. Lossy compression discards less important information whereas lossless compression retains information by simplifying the code. There are many resources on the web that explain these in more detail. If you're interested, I recommend starting with the Getty Institute's Introduction to Imaging. I do want to comment a little on file formats as they are fundamental to ensuring accessibility. For master's files, it's important that file formats are suited for long-term sustainability and are capable of meeting your compression requirements. For a list of preferred file types, consult our guidance on sustainable file formats. When you are selecting your file formats, consider the formats, compression methods or options, so lossy, lossless or uncompressed, uh, its ability to hold metadata, ability to facilitate optical character or text recognition. The page display, do you need a file format that can display things as a single page or do you need it as a multi-page view? And their compatibility with software programs. The size and quality of a digital image is a product of its technical elements. Image resolution, colour properties, compression and the file format all contribute to the quality and size of a digital image. Unfortunately, there is no magic bullet to concurrently reduce file size and maintain quality. It is a compromise. To reduce file size, one or more of the technical elements will need to be decreased. Establishing technical specifications is about striking that acceptable balance. Create a high quality master file for preservation if records have longer retention periods or are required as state archives. Where file sizes need to be smaller for delivery purposes, e.g. email, a lower quality version can be derived from the master file.
Equipment for digitisation should be selected when you have an understanding of the records you intend to digitise and your technical specifications for image quality. It is very tempting to look at the technology first and fit it to a project's needs. However, you may find that you are missing functionality you actually require for your project after the purchase has been made. A number of organisations use multifunction devices as photocopiers to operate as scanners. For digitisation programs, particularly the scanning of incoming records. Sometimes the functionality of a multifunctional device will be sufficient for your digitisation needs. However, sometimes it will not. If you are intending to use a multifunctional device, you need to check that it can meet your specifications. You will also need to determine appropriate device settings and business rules for using the multifunctional device for digitisation purposes. Another requirement which needs consideration is metadata. Adequate, persistent and searchable descriptive metadata supports accessibility and retrieval whilst structural or technical metadata supports the digitised record's authenticity by documenting the digitisation process. The linking of metadata to records can also be seen as an element of completeness as this is where the context comes in. In general, file and image names should be unique, consistently structured, include the use of leading zeros, to facilitate sorting and avoid special characters or symbols as they, these can cause problems across operating platforms. The naming conventions used do not necessarily need to reflect the original document title. They could employ a unique identifier, for example, one consisting of an alpha prefix and numerical sequence. The main thing is that the naming rules are consistently applied and documented for future reference. Descriptive metadata is commonly managed alongside the digitised record, for example, in a business system or NDRMS, where it is connected to the digital file. Depending on the file formats used, metadata can also be embedded into the digitised file itself you will need to determine which descriptive fields are relevant to your program. Generally, this would include things like title, creator, and original creation date, as well as any custom fields relevant to your program. If the records are required as state archives, it is recommended to include the required fields for transfer so that you're saving effort later. You will also need to decide if text recognition is a requirement of your program. This may be subject to the clarity of your original documents. Text recognition uh, may also enable you the ability to automate some of the metadata capture, particularly if your documents follow a standardised structure. Technical metadata is a byproduct of the digitisation process. Data such as imaging device, software used, date and time of the image creation, file format, resolution, bit depth, etc., even the number of revisions or edits in post production can be automatically recorded. So, technical metadata is a very useful tool to document the digitization itself. Equipment and software may need to be adjusted. Um, to ensure that this technical metadata is being embedded. Quality management enables you to ensure the authenticity, completeness and accessibility of digitised records. It involves checking digitisation processes and digitised images against benchmarks to ensure that the benchmarks are being suitably applied and met in practice. This includes meeting technical specifications and also aspects like page presentation, metadata completeness and accuracy, and handling and management of original documents to prevent damage. 
loss of sequence or unauthorised destruction. It is a condition of GA45 for quality checks to be completed before any original paper records are destroyed. Consider which processes will need to be assessed. For example, um, imaging quality and accuracy of metadata, will they be subject to quality control? Um, what is the pass or fail criteria and the levels of tolerance? Determine which elements can be checked via metadata and which can need a manual or visual inspection and determine if all records will be checked or just a sample or percentage. Often when initiating programs you may start with checking a higher percentage of your um, files and as you get more confident with your procedures um, reduce this down a little bit. Established Workflows for checking digitisation processes and digitised images against benchmarks uh, ensure that benchmarks are being met. You should outline the nature, degree and regularity of quality assurance measures in procedures or business rules and if outsourcing, ensure that the benchmarks are communicated to service providers and are covered in service agreements. Quality assurance also involves um, some consideration of how any quality assurance fails or, or redos um, are managed. So I have another poll here, um, and I'm interested to know how the COVID-19 pandemic has changed um, your approach or demand for digitization. Yes, yeah, so I can see there in the results here that um, demand has sort of somewhat increased and for some agencies it has decreased dramatically, um, but for others it, it's remained about the same. So I guess you know that there might be some things there to be said about um, working models and maybe what percentage of um, your, I guess, organisational information is already in digital format. Um, but yeah, thank you for voting on that one. So condition four, uh, when implementing GA45, the copies become the official record of business and are kept in accordance with authorization, authorised retention requirements. So in essence, what this means is that once the original records are destroyed, the copies take their place as the official record or even as the state, state record. Um, the copy or digitised record uh, then needs to be kept for the remainder of the retention period outlined in the appropriate general or functional authority. One method of manage, managing digitised records as official records is to integrate them into an NDRMS or business system whereby retention requirements can be implemented and managed within the system. If the records are required as state archives, Requirements and schedules for the transfer of digitised records, as well as the physical records, uh, should be discussed and predetermined with us at State, Ar State Archives and Records. Following digitisation, the digitised records will need to be stored, backed up and managed effectively for as long as they are required. It is particularly important to store master files in a way that can promote and ensure their security and longevity. Managing digitised files may involve integrating digitised records into business or record keeping systems, ensuring final or master copies of the digitised records are secure from unauthorised alteration. This may mean um, control of versions uh, documenting plans and strategies for managing long-term accessibility of the records and inclusion of digitised records 
on the organization's information asset register. The final condition of GA45 is that the original or source records are kept for quality control purposes for an appropriate length of time. In determining an appropriate length of time to retain the records following digitization, public officers should consider the level of insurance that full and accurate records have been created, level of assurance that digital images are being well managed in a record keeping system, robustness of digitization processes, including quality assurance processes, the level of assurance that records authenticity is being maintained. Um, so this would be determined through the results of quality assurance processes and the need for access to the original paper records for other purposes such as legal proceedings. Steps which may be undertaken to ensure the quality of the digitised images include visual verification, visual verification that all content, including um, all pages or all documents have been captured. Visual verification also ensures you know, that you know, there's some readability and accessibility that things actually open up there. Uh, there'd also be verification of the file formats and technical specifications. So you can check your, your file properties and your technical metadata and also ensure adequate uh, file titling and descriptive metadata is present to identify the records and allow retrieval. The physical or source records should not be disposed of until the public office is satisfied that quality checks have been undertaken and an acceptable level of quality assurance has been reached. If for any reason quality cannot be assured, then the clock does not start until corrective action has occurred. How original records should be managed and if they will be retained or disposed of will depend on the records concerned and the intended outcomes of the digitization program. Where original records will be retained, consider recollation requirements, how will documents be put back together? For example, will tube clips, plastic pockets, stables and pins, etc., be put back into place? Consider rehousing, it's an optimum time for that, and consider transfer requirements. If the records have long-term accountability requirements or are required as state archives, um, as I mentioned, this will be a perfect time to rehouse them into archival um, housings or containers. Where original records will be destroyed under GA45, consider when can they be destroyed? So at what process is that quality assurance we discussed earlier complete? Uh, how destruction will be documented? And how internal authorization to destroy the records will be granted? So what is the approval process? For scanning of incoming records, this documentation and authorization could be built into business rules and procedures. For retrospective programs or projects, this may involve seeking authorization at a batch level following quality assurance. So once you have determined all of your requirements, it is advisable to document and communicate them to establish governance over your program. This also relates back to the concept of authenticity. Requirements should be outlined in documents such as business rules, procedures, project plans, contractual agreements, etc. as appropriate. Remember to review your requirements at regular intervals or as your circumstances change. So just to recap, um, we've spoken about a lot of things through this presentation. Um, before commencing the, your digitization programs, you need to um, define outcomes. If destruction is in scope, you'll need to consider how you're going to meet the conditions of GA45. Um, you'll need to scope your record selection and note any records excluded under GA45. Um, you should determine your approach 
how will you in ensure that authenticity, completeness and accessibility throughout the digitisation process? And you should document requirements in policies, procedures, business rules and or contracts. And you should review your requirements periodically. So that um, brings us to the conclusion of my presentation. Uh, thank you for uh, listening and um, we can move on to any questions that uh, you may have. Um, Tara, I've got a question yeah. with Abdallah from Abdallah and I'm just trying yeah. to see whether I can actually unmute him. Hang on. So he can um, ask yeah. his own question, yeah. Hang on. I don't think he's able to unmute okay. himself. Anyway, okay, so we've got a question from Abdallah. Um, he's asking if the records created in 1980 are in good conditions, can we digitize and destroy? Yeah, so that destruction date is January 1, 1980. So if and, and actually, it, it depends. So, so there's there's two things here. So, firstly, if the records are required as state archives, and, sorry, there's a lot of feedback on the line there. Um, I think we've yep. yep. Sorry, that's that's better. Um, yeah. So, there's two things at play. So, if the records are required as state archives, um, that's when that 1980 date applies. So, anything created from 1 January 1980 onwards can be destroyed regardless of whether it's a state archive or not. If the records are not required as state archives within an approved retention and disposal authority, they can be destroyed regardless of their creation um, date. So I hope that answers your question there, Adela. Okay, thanks, Tara. And we've got another question um, with regards to the timeline for digital retrieval of records transferred to state archives. So um, I think I'll take this question. So anything related about um, retrieval from the collection services or from the collection, we're not really able to um, provide you an answer at this stage. What we can do is that we can actually just um, take note of your question and then get someone from the collection services to contact you guys. Um, we don't have that information handy with us at the moment. Um, so we've got another question from Narelle. Um, it's about we have a secondary system or authority which creates files into our, our records management si system but cannot have leading zeros in the file number. Is this acceptable? Yeah, Narelle, I, th I, think, I think it is. Um, I think how you structure, structure, sorry, a lot of noise coming through there again. Um, how you structure your file names, um, it, it's, it's really up to sort of you to work out um, what, what works best um, within your organisation. Um, the main thing is that these file names are unique. Um, so some, sometimes what we have is when, um, say, you want to use a file name as your descriptor, you might actually have, you know, several files re relating to the same name. Um, sometimes, too, if you're using um, original file names, they can be a little bit long and they need to be concatenated um, as well. So it, it's up to you how you manage that. A, a lot of agencies do choose to use those original file names and others um, will choose to create a unique identifier. So within that, whichever way you're doing it, um, whether it's a name or whether you are using a unique identifier, you could still add, you know, a, a, um, a number at the end that had some leading zeros to help you um, sort those. So if you had, you know, more than more than one relating to the same thing, for example, you you could have a running number. Um, I hope I hope that makes sense. It should be fine. I'm trying to unmute all the participants so that that way you can actually unmute yourself if you wanted to ask your questions um, individually as well. But, yeah, here, go on. Yeah, hi. Um, 
it's Andre from the New South Wales Social Clinical Excellence Commission. Look, we are wrapping up a digitisation project and I so wish that we'd had this advice um, uh, six months ago, but look, uh, it turns out we're mostly in alignment. My questions are twofold. One, uh, about the scanning in the QA, uh, the, not scanning, sampling in the QA process. So I completely understand your point about um, doing more at the beginning and then as you become confident doing less. But um, obviously errors could still be made. Is there is there any guidance about about um, you know the, the the detail of that scanning process? Obviously, we can't check every document we've scanned. No, you can't, Andre. <laughs> um, I, I think it's about um, maybe assessing the risks associated with the original records as well. So if you're um, scanning really high risk documents. Um, you may want to do a higher level of QA than what you would if, for example, the records are quite low risk. Uh, I think um, the, you know, the goal would be to ensure that you know, everything is 100% complete, but the reality is that um, you know, most agencies would not have the resources to be doing that level of, of checking. So I think it, it's about placing your resources in the right places and um, assessing the risks associated with, with those original records. If you did have something, yeah, um, yeah that, that, does that make sense? The I really, think, the I think really risk based makes a lot of sense. And, yeah. and, uh, and also it would be good to be able to, uh, I, I can put that in a brief, that's fantastic. The other one, hopefully quite quick, but very related as well. Um, we obviously have some detailed classes of records and, uh, and I'm not quite sure who to ask to get some uh, uh, specific formal advice about some of those classes with respect to our digitisation project. Am I able to get in touch with uh, you or one of the team to talk about that? Uh, yeah, Andre, if you just want to send us an email through um, to our general um, record keeping standards and advice email address, which is um, govrec yeah. at records. Yeah, this, it's yeah. on the screen there. <laughs> yeah, so yeah it's on the email. screen. Fantastic. Thank you so yeah. much. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, we have Tony Anderson also asking a question. Are you able to unmute yourself? Okay, so anyway, I've got... Um, I think Tony is probably unable to unmute herself. So anyway, yep. there's something in here. Um, her question is, is there a recommended approach to back capturing digital images of physical files? Example given, so each document is scanned or all documents scanned as one set or somewhere in between. So I think that would be really dependent on how you're going to access these physical files or these um, digital images of the documents. Um, do you want to add on that, Tara? Um, are we talking about an individual kind of, um, I guess, file here, or are we talking this kind of about this kind of, I guess, a group of records, or like a, a sort of a, a series level? Um, so it could be just a physical file with lots and lots of records in it. So obviously, she's asking whether we should scan it or, you know, one you know, one page at a time, or maybe multiple um, or documents are scanned as one set, or multiple records scanned as one set, and then just sort of save it into one file or container. Yeah, I think, that, again, I think that's sort of a, a decision that you would make, um, I guess, depending on, on, on the, the purpose that you have um, for that. So, you know, you might have uh, an option to scan these all as individual files or you might want um, for display purposes to, you know, have you know, a multi-page PDF or, or something like that. And I, I think there's a decision that you can um, make there depending on your intended outcome. And another way to do it would be um, that you could image everything as um, individual items, which is often what you need to do if you're using a TIFF format. And then you could have sort of that secondary derivative copy that, that's a merged um, document together to facilitate that access. So there, there's a couple of, of different ways around that. And it, it really just comes back to um, yeah, your, your purpose.
a lot of questions in here actually. So we've got another yeah. one from, yeah. So, so first of all, there's a lot of questions about whether we're gonna make this webinar recording available. Um, yeah. Yes, we will. We will actually upload it into our website and um, we will let everyone know, or at least we'll send an email to everyone as soon as we're able to um, process the webinar recording and the presentation. And then um, I've got a question here from Katazina. If you can unmute yourself. And then she's still here. And we've no designation from this one. Remember, we're not going to use designations until it comes to the annual appeal. Yeah, hi. Uh, I just wanted to double check. Um, we're still using our GA39 and just wanted to double check. There was a, a special clause in there for 1920 um, and previous records and just wanted to double check that it's still valid that they um, pretty much don't get touched at all and get sent off to state. Um, Angela, do you want to answer that question? Yeah, um, yeah, that is still in place at all. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, 1920 council records are required as state archives. Now, if um, you work for, a, we have had instances where if you work for like a large council that's got a very, very complete holding of records um, and you've got things like very, routine financial journals that show nothing. We have in the past given permission to destroy pre-1920 records, but that's a pretty unusual occurrence. So yeah, um, so they are required as state archives and you can send them to us. Um, if you've got queries around particular pre-1920 council records, just send an email to GovRec. The, the pre-1920 thing was based on the assumption that there weren't many pre-1920 council records around. Um, there certainly are in Sydney, because I, where I used to work, they had them from 1842, but yeah, it's still there. That's great, thank you. Um, I think we've still got some questions, but we're running out of time, so I think we need to wrap up, Tara. Yep, that's so yeah. what we what we might do is we might answer those questions um, offline and get back to you. Offline. Okay. Thanks everyone for attending our webinars, our first webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great, great piece of work. Thanks. Good session. Thank you. And if, and if you could please answer the um, exit survey, that would be um, really appreciated for us to help with our um, future program planning. Uh, thank you all for um, being a great audience today. Hi Tara, how are you going? Yeah, I'm just going to um, close the session off. Thank, thanks everyone again. Yeah. Yeah, that went well, I thought.